Hello and welcome to Commodity Champions, your weekly dose of what's brewing in the commodity space. I am Manisha Gupta. Well, this has been a week which is going down as the worst week in all of 2019 until time for the commodities as an asset class. So whether you look at energy space where both the crude varieties, Brent and US, is down between 5 to 6 percent, the metal prices are down anywhere between 1.5 to 6 percent on the lower side as well, with steel actually declining the most. That one is down 5.5 percent. You also are looking at zinc down 4.5%, copper is down 2%. So as I said, whichever way you look, whether it is energy, industrial metals, agriculture space as well has seen a decline. And most of the commodity indexes also are headed for a weekly decline this time around. It has to do with the rising macro concerns, the geopolitical tensions, expectations that the global's demand growth may slow down going forward. And then, of course, there is uh, strength in US dollar and the sell-off that we saw in the global equities in this week also impacting the commodity prices. But is it a correction? Is it an opportunity to buy? Are the market forces going to change from here is what we are going to discuss at the, our commodity champions today. Joining us to talk about that and much more is Paul Siena, who is chief global FICC technical strategist. He's also director of research at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Paul, hi. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Well, we have seen uh, crude oil prices decline quite sharply in this week. What has been your sense? What would you want to watch out for between global tensions, geopolitical concerns, the OPEC reiterating that they are going to withhold supply for second half of 2019 as well? How do you or what do you make of all of these fundamentals? Sure. So thank you again for having me back. Um, you know, what's happening in global markets, whether it be the Middle East tensions uh, regarding the pipelines and oil prices or tension with North Korea, the U.S. trying to jade tariffs, uh, the world is not short on macro issues right now. And that's certainly a factor in what's happening with oil markets. Now, what's great about technicals is we can kind of set those factors aside and really look at what price action is telling us and what our signals are telling us. And what happened about two weeks ago in our oil charts, both the Brent crude oil future as well as the WTI oil future, was a golden cross signal. This occurs when the 50-day moving average crosses above the 200-day moving average. And what tends to happen, at least in the past, is oil prices are actually higher about 40 to 50 trading days later. So looking at the WTI charts, looking at the Brent charts, if let's say the 60 to $61 area on WTI holds and the respective 200 day moving average on the Brent oil chart holds, I think oil prices are destined to make a new year to date high. So Paul, how would you look at the crude oil prices? Would you want to break it on quarter on quarter basis on what your sense or range is for the crude prices going forward? And how specifically do the prices seem to you for the second half of 2019, where we will see various fundamentals like the hurricanes, the OPEC meetings, and then it is about the US driving demand season as well? Sure, I think the pressure for higher oil prices is a summer or mid-year pressure being that a new year-to-date high would happen likely by the end of July. Uh, the second half of the year could be different, but realistically, as a technician, for us to turn bearish on oil prices, we need to see an established top. And we don't have a top in the oil charts yet. Uh, we had a peak, uh, we had a correction about three waves lower, and then we had another bullish cross. So. The trend is up until there's an established, confirmed top. Uh, I would be suspicious of something like that forming by midsummer uh, and possibly lower oil prices thereafter, but that's a speculation. For now, I think the bias is higher oil prices and to uh, essentially buy the dip. Yes. So, you know, when you look at uh, various global uh, reports, uh, most people seem to believe that the crude oil prices in this year and the better part of next year as well will be range bound between 65 to 85 dollars per barrel. Do you share that view? I wouldn't pin oil prices of all things to really trade in a range for that long. Um, a $20 range in oil prices is... Um, Maybe a characteristic of oil, since that's rather wide, but uh, I think oil prices will be susceptible to rather notable peaks and troughs 
for the you know medium to longer term as opposed to truly stabilizing and hugging a level uh, like seventy dollars or something like that. I think they will continue to swing, and it is a more of a trader's market and a technical market than uh, anything else. Paul, I know you very closely look into the currency and the bond markets as well, and dollar index has continued to strengthen for this year, uh, building up on the gains that we saw in the previous year as well, and that does impact uh, other asset classes, more specifically commodities. So while we are looking at strength in dollar index versus the emerging market currencies, most of the major currencies as well, do you see further strength now continuing for dollar, and what impact do you see of that on other asset classes? Sure. So, you know, the dollar index, both, uh, you know, the, the, the G6 based index and the G10 based index, both of them continue to grind higher this year. Notably, the DXY, which is probably the most popular index followed as a representation for the dollar, has yet to break the 9833 year to date high. So that's a very important near term technical resistance level to be aware of. Ending last week, the DXY chart did form a bullish pennant pattern. So there is a short-term technical bias to think the DXY can make a new year-to-date high and can make a move to about 99.50, maybe that 100 psychological level. Uh, that would coincide with lower euro dollar, likely breaking the 111 to 111.30 support area and migrating lower as low as 108. Um, where we're seeking more confirmation for, for these signals and trends to happen because euro dollar has just been pinned to about that 111 to 112 area and nothing has moved it. None of the macro tensions, none of the good or bad data, none of the central bank uh, messages uh, over the last few weeks. So it's, uh, it's a trendless market there in euro dollar. And I think what the dollar is telling us more broadly is that dollar is strong versus emerging market currencies, uh, potentially vulnerable or neutral versus the G6 currencies, right? So the opportunity for the dollar is to essentially buy the dollar versus emerging market FX on the dips. So dollar CNH had a wonderful three week rally. Uh, off the 670 area, that's probably going to correct and is a buying opportunity. Uh, Dollar Korea did the same thing. Uh, but then how does all of this kind of tie back into oil, right? Uh, you know, the textbooks would tell us that the dollar and oil have an important correlation, that being stronger dollar relates to weaker oil. Over the years, that correlation has very much broken down. So can the dollar, which is paying a very nice carry for, for long trades, continue to grind higher while oil prices make a new high? Absolutely. Now, where that could truly have a, a negative impact, unfortunately, I think is on the rupee, right? Dollar rupee has a five wave wedge pattern that is formed, and it's a continuation wedge of the rally that occurred a couple of years ago. So higher dollar versus EM, higher oil prices, uh, that may have a negative impact on the rupee this year. Paul, you mentioned about the Indian rupee, and yes, in the emerging markets, we have seen rupee actually gain up in the last one week or this week with the kind of exit polls that we see. Elections are now out of the way. The new government is going to get in, and we have seen a thumping majority come in, which in itself uh, does mean a positivity for uh, the, the markets and the Indian rupee as well. But do you see the rupee strength lasting? How would you see the rest of 2019 now for the Indian rupee? Sure. Uh, so we generally chart the uh, one month INR forward and uh, on a medium term basis, the major support area or buy zone is in the 68s. Uh, a few weeks ago, the you know spot price action moved down into the 68s and held on a technical basis and then began to rally north of 70 again. Um, obviously, India has had some elections over the last week that have reinforced some strength for the rupee and some optimism. So the brief sell-off we're seeing here in dollar rupees, I think, is viable, provided the 68s hold. Now, you'll see the 200-week moving average is beginning to slope up into the 68s. I think that will add to the support level going forward if dollar rupee does decline into that area again for a second buying opportunity. And I think as long as we're holding that 68 figure, 
the view stands that dollar rupee could retest last year's high of about 75. Paul, I also want your attention on the intermarket uh, analysis. Uh, when you look at bonds, equities, uh, commodities, currencies, what do you think these asset classes would want to watch out for for the remaining 2019 now? Sure. So one of the ways that we look across global markets is on a relative basis. And we practice uh, what our books call intermarket analysis, but is uh, another word for cross-asset analysis. And I think there are some very important messages coming from these cross-asset charts um, that uh, I guess make me a little pessimistic about the second half of the year. So one of those is the ratio of the U.S. long bond treasury future divided by copper prices. So that ratio has formed a head and shoulders bottom which essentially means bond prices outperform copper prices. That is a negative message about growth, about inflation, uh, and you know, a lot of the macro factors that are, that are, that are at hand right now. Uh, speaking of head and shoulder patterns, uh, we look at the U.S. two-year Treasury yield. Uh, that chart formed a head and shoulders top in yield earlier this year. It actually broke the neckline of 2.4%. I believe in late January, then it retested the level and yields continue to fall. Uh, our view suggests that two-year yield could go as low as 1.78%, right? So if U.S. two-year Treasury yield goes to 1.78% in line with this head and shoulders top pattern that is formed, then that's a message that the Fed may actually be cutting later this year, potentially next year, right? Um, so. You know, looking at some of these cross-asset relationships, looking at some of these technical patterns in, in all of the markets, um, it says the volatility is here and it's probably going to continue. So when you look at uh, the global concerns, when you look at the international markets, it really is about tangible commodities which start, uh, you know, including absorbing a lot of cash with the kind, uh, and especially copper, which is seen as the barometer of the global economic growth. And copper prices have seen a very sharp decline. We've seen them trading at a four-month lows, $6,000 per a ton on LME has broken below as well. So when you look at these kind of movements, does it give you a concern on where the global economy really could be headed? What is your sense uh, on, on many of these metal prices going forward? Sure. So... Um... You know, there's a few things that come to mind. Uh, you mentioned the LME copper forward. Uh, um, you know, 6,000 is the big level. Uh, similarly, on the HG contract that trades in the U.S., uh, about 271 is a big level. After that, the next levels are about 5% lower. Uh, after that, they're a lot lower. So there is less and less support left in these markets for the established uptrend since 2016, and that's a concern to me. Uh, when, I, when we start running out of support levels, it simply means we're in a downtrend and not an uptrend anymore. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing. Uh, as a factor of copper prices, maybe more iron ore, the Australian dollar versus the U.S. dollar made a big breakdown over the last couple of weeks. It finally took out the 70 level and traded down almost to the 2016 low of 68.20. So this breakdown in Aussie dollar confirms a descending triangle pattern, which is bearish for the Aussie and essentially bullish for the dollar. And if the Australian dollar is going to go into the mid-60s, that's not going to be a good sign for risk, and it's not going to be a good sign for uh, base metals, iron ore, copper prices, etc. So uh, putting those two things together, um, you know, where we're concerned about uh, what the FIC market is saying about risk versus what, let's say, the equity markets are saying about risk. There's a bifurification of views there, and uh, if the bond market and metals market is going to be right, then equity markets are at risk. However, if for some reason equity markets are right this time, then you know commodity markets are underpriced and, and Aussie's underpriced and copper's underpriced. Okay, final question to you then, Paul. Uh, road ahead, what, where do you see a better opportunity of investment now arising, given the kind of scenario that we are in right now, where there is a Brexit concern, where there is a U.S. and China trade war still on, the talks have been stretched, geopolitical tensions, currency moves. Where, according to you, is a safer, slightly longer-term, better investment opportunity? Sure. 
I think opportunity lies uh, in the next couple of weeks to essentially uh, hedge some of the positions that you have for the potential volatility spikes, uh, macro headline risk, uh, geopolitical risk that could occur this summer. So uh, dollar yen or essentially buying the yen is an interesting uh, set of charts to look at. Uh, dollar yen is now rallying towards the gap from two weeks ago at about 111. I think trading into that gap is an opportunity to sell dollar yen as a way to hedge your portfolio or to position for increased volatility this summer. Euro yen is an appealing trade as well. Uh, given the breakdown in Aussie and the, and, the, and the bond copper view, Aussie yen could also be a, a third choice for downside uh, and the volatility play for uh, macro risk this summer. All right, Paul Siena, we'll let you go at that. That's a view coming in from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, that the crude oil prices are headed higher. They may make a new high by the end of, 20, uh, by end of July 2019. And we are looking at more strength continuing for the Indian rupee until the time they hold 68. As far as the metal prices are concerned, well, could see some more decline, but it is the U.S. dollar which actually could continue to see further strength in the rest of 2019 too. But with that, let's go for a break. When we come back, we will have Navneet Damani of Motilal Oswal joining us with his strategies and his preparation for the week coming by in case of commodities.